Hey guys, it's Girl Got Game. Welcome to a new gander, finally, after months and months. We're gonna be playing Changeling today. Uh, this is a game by Steambury, as you saw in the opening there. Steambury Stu uh, Steam Studio, rather. Pardon me. Uh, I got uh, contacted about this by Lisa from there. Uh, back during the Great Bronchitis Death situation I was in a few months ago. <laughs> And unfortunately, because of said situation, I wasn't able to take a look at this then. But now that I'm finally well and I've caught up on all the backlog of everything I've had to catch up on for the last two to three months, I can finally play this and I'm glad. Uh, because this looks beautiful and I really wanted to check it out. So I thought we could spend some time today and take a look at it. Um, it's a dark, fantastical, romantic comedy uh, where you can date... I think it's six guys? Yeah, there's six guys here on the title screen, and they're all different supernatural beings. And you're trying to rediscover your past while navigating the dangers of a supernatural world. So, kind of an interesting premise, eh? I think we should jump into this and see what this game has in store for us. First name. Ooh, I can pick a name. Hmm. Um, oh gosh. Name's escaping me right now. Huh. Let's be Mariposa. Mariposa. Um... Mariposa Price, and <laughs> the price is from for Chloe from Life is Strange, because there's a butterfly involved. And now the story begins, Mariposa Price. When I was little, I dreamed of being carried away to a far-off land. It was a recurring dream of flying through the air, surrounded by softly singing voices. Ooh... Back then, I read book after book of old fairy tales in my grandmother's study. The kind where good children didn't always make it out of the dark swamp unscathed, and sometimes the goblins won. Let me read this. When the world was young and the boundaries between the natural and supernatural were less distinct, the fae were much more widespread than they are in modern times. They dwelt in every forest, in every tree or stone, and under every hill. They were secretive and shy, but even if they stayed out of sight, they were never far from where humans were. Before mortals grew away from nature, fairies always lingered near to watch them. Most fairies had a great love for humans, especially human children. Though their lives were short, their souls were like brilliant flames that burned out all too quickly. And like moths to candles, the fae were drawn to those flames. They would wait until night to sneak through open windows or slip through any crack in search of unguarded human children. When they found them defenseless and unprotected, the fairies would carry the these babies to the realm of fae, in hopes of rejuvenating their own frail race with a vibrant fire of human life force. And in the place of the stolen baby, they would leave a fairy child disguised with fairy glamour. These children were called changelings. Pretty. During the day, I would run through the forest by our house and pretend the stories were real. Every tree was a sentinel watching over me, and rustling leaves were the sweet whispers of fairies coaxing me further and further from the house. Then it all crumbled. The trees and games had to be left behind. Books were left to gather dust on shelves, and dreams were left to fade into memory. Years passed, and all that remained were the distant games and pretend play of childhood. Back then, I didn't know that real fairy tales were darker than anything I could possibly have dreamed of on my own. Chapter 1. Homecoming. The Common Route. Click. Clicking is right. We had nearly reached the new house. I was eager to get out of this cramped car and see the new place. The long road trip wasn't agreeing with me, but I couldn't complain too much. After five years in a city I hated, we were finally moving back to Pine Hollow, the place where I grew up. That alone was enough to keep my sanity intact during the tense trip back. Unfortunately, the reason behind the move wasn't fantastic. Grandpa was ill again, and this time was under strict orders to take it easy. 
Since he had to avoid stress, he needed Dad's help with his business. Of course, he didn't think so, but Grandma was adamant, get help or retire. So we were on our way back so Dad could take over. In theory, anyway. Not that Grandpa would let him. In any case, Dad wasn't too happy about leaving his current job or our house in the city behind, much less moving back across state lines to our previous home. I was, though. I missed Grandma and Grandpa. I missed the trees and the looming embrace of the mountains that made Pine Hollow feel enclosed and protected. I missed my best friend. What I wouldn't miss was the stifling humidity of the city, the constant smell of hot rubber and car exhaust. Not to mention the lack of stars and the way rain made everything smell like rust instead of warm earth. It wasn't all terrible. The parks were pretty, and being nearer to the water had been fun. School hadn't been awful. I was hardly the loner girl skulking in the corners. I'd had friends, and I would miss them. But Allie wasn't just a friend. She was practically family. No one in the city could compare with that. And the city had never felt like home. I smiled slightly as the scenery beyond the car windows became more and more familiar. My tiredness faded to excitement. Spencer. This new house isn't that far from the old one, is it? They're only a few miles apart. This one's in a different neighborhood, though. Dad. Lots of trees, very wooded. I think you two will really like it after we get settled in. Dad said that, but from the look on Spencer's face, I didn't think it was true. Not for him, anyway. Dad pointed to a small forested mountain a few miles ahead. The neighborhood is nestled right at the foot there and winds up the slope. It feels rural, but it's within walking distance of the town square. I was glad that it didn't look like much development had happened in the years we'd been gone. In fact, it didn't look like much had changed at all. So much forest. I almost forgot what it was like. It looks easy to get lost in. I gave him a sharp look and found him staring at me in that disquieting way he'd picked up over the last few years. He was already trying to start a fight about that. I quickly looked away, unwilling to give him the satisfaction. Man, we look so much like our mom. Another thing I missed was me and Spencer being close. Like everyone seemed to think twins ought to be. But I didn't think that just moving back to Pine Hollow was going to fix that, though. Not with jabs like that aimed at me. Let it go already. No one is going to get lost. And I want you both to give me your word you'll be careful in the forest. I don't want to have to ban you from hiking. Ugh, and now Mom was starting, too. I slumped back in the seat, watching the kaleidoscope of fall colors slide past. I had expected that issue to be brought up now that we were moving back. But I hadn't expected to start getting lectured before we even reached the new house. The realtor said there are trails. But you know that probably means animal trails, not actual hiking trails. It can be dangerous if you aren't careful. We're not little kids anymore. There are lots of coyotes here, and cougars, even bears. There's also a pretty deep ravine in the woods behind the house from what I understand. We just want to make sure everyone stays safe. Now that we're back, we don't want... Jeez, it's been five years. I couldn't entirely blame everyone for their uneasiness about the whole thing. The disappearance five years ago. My disappearance five years ago was the reason we moved in the first place. Not just the disappearance itself, though I'd been gone for more than a week, and that had definitely caused some drama, but there was the issue of how I just showed back up, and the other things that happened around that time. Am I a changeling? Five years later, my family was still shadowed by the repercussions of what had happened back then. Although, from what I remember about changelings, they usually don't grow. They just stay. They stay looking like the kid they replaced. So I can't be- I, well, I mean, you could just change the lore, I guess, but... Hmm. Of course I wanted them to move on. Everything back then had been my fault. Not just the drama the family had endured as a whole, but also what had happened to Spencer. Those weren't wounds that could just heal overnight. Not the emotional ones, not the physical ones, and definitely not the one inflicted on our relationship. And no amount of apologizing had ever helped. Dad turned onto a quiet street that wound its way up into the trees. A few rooftops poked through the foliage. 
It was a great neighborhood that reminded me a little of where we'd lived before. The sweetness of nostalgia helped wash away some of the lingering bitterness from the previous conversation. I loved the place from the moment we turned onto the street and passed over a trickling creek that vanished into the woods. Down at the foot of the mountain, and within walking distance of the houses, was the main street of the town, filled with little shops and restaurants. But the neighborhood, hidden behind a thick wall of trees and curled around the mountainside, felt secluded and quiet. It was beautiful and perfect. Mariposa, go check the boxes up in your room to make sure they put the right ones there. I'll let you unpack your things first, and I want you downstairs to help in the kitchen. Spencer, same for you! Movers had already arranged most of the furniture in the house under Grandma's supervision, but the boxes with the smaller items and personal belongings still needed unpacking. Since she had to take care of Grandpa, Grandma couldn't do much more than tell them where to put the furniture and try to get the basics set up for us. We still had a ton of work to do. Mom immediately busied herself trying to hang curtains and make the house look lived in. Dad started ripping into the boxes in the family room. Spencer vanished upstairs. I left Mom in the kitchen and went to take a look at the rest of the downstairs. This house is really great. I'm glad you like it, honey. It wasn't new, but had been renovated inside. It looked modern and new, but still felt old and full of memories. And someone else's history. I love it already. My bedroom was right next to Spencer's. The only thing separating them was a small shared bathroom. That was going to be so much fun. He tended to act like any intrusion into his personal space was a huge affront, so I had to walk on eggshells if I didn't want to fight with him. I could only begin to imagine his whining about having to share counter space with all my icky girl things, like a hairbrush and hand lotion. The horror. That aside, my room was pretty nice. It was bright and airy, and I loved seeing my things already put exactly where I had put, put them anyway. It looks like Grandma even got my bed ready. All I had to do was unpack the rest of my personal stuff. Creak. I started with my school things, pulling the tape off one box to get at what was inside. Suddenly, the door to my side of the bathroom burst open. Spencer stalked in, dropping a dusty box on my clean bedspread. He could have at least knocked. They gave me one of yours. Don't pick a fight. Just stay calm. I moved the box to the floor without saying anything. Spencer started to leave. Hang on, let me make sure I don't have any of yours. Hopefully he didn't make a habit of bursting in. Being my twin brother didn't mean he got to invade my privacy whenever he wanted. Especially since he'd have an aneurysm if I had slammed into his room that way. I quickly sorted through the boxes to see if any of his were lurking in my room. Sure enough, I found one with his name clearly scrawled on the top. Here, I think this one has some of your clothes. I nudged the box toward him with my foot. He scowled at me before picking it up and stalking back to his room. The door on his side of the bathroom slammed shut. Yeah, you're welcome. It felt like every interaction with him was like that lately. It was worse than ever, actually. But then, he wasn't likely to forget his negative memories of Pine Hollow soon. And I was pretty sure he was just annoyed by the fact I was happy to be back. Which meant taking it out on me, of course. He'd never loved this place the way I had anyway, so he wasn't really inclined to overlook the bad memories in the first place. <sighs> I continued pulling things out of boxes. Patience, patience. It was just... hard to have all this stuff stirred up again. I mean, even if I accepted responsibility for what happened back then, I didn't think it meant I also had to sentence myself to guilt and misery forever. Not for something that had happened when I was 12, something I couldn't even remember. I left my boxes on the floor and went to peer out the window. I pressed my head against the glass, watching the trees sway slightly in the fall breeze. So pretty. It was probably stupid to say I felt more complete in this town. At a glance, it looked like dozens of others you could find scattered through the area. It was beautiful and sunny sometimes, and others, it was really eerie. There were days when the clouds hung low over the mountains, the fog was super thick through the trees, and you could almost imagine it was haunted. Well, with a name like Pine Hollow. <laughs> the truth was that I felt I'd lost something in this place five years ago. Maybe I was only happy to be here because I felt that now I had the chance to get it back. I left the window and went back to unpacking before Mom so started yelling at me to come join the battle of unbubble wrapping the kitchenware. In any case, I was being annoyingly sentimental. Pine Hollow was special to me, maybe, but it wasn't special in general. 
It was one of those little towns with more urban legends than any reasonable person could count. Hundreds of stories about creepy ha happenings in the woods. And for every one of them, no matter how unlikely, there were dozens of people willing to believe it. That's probably why people were so quick to leap on the oddities of my disappearances. Disappearances? Plural? They weren't even really that odd. At least I didn't think so. The rational public wrote them off as strange but explainable. I got lost, then got unlost. Big deal. Though, to be fair, the first time it happened I was nine. And when I got unlost, I was also unhurt. Even after ten days in the woods alone. It was definitely lucky I got home safely. It wasn't supernatural. Not like some people apparently insisted. It was just the amnesia that caught people off guard, I think. I couldn't remember a thing that happened while I was missing. I still couldn't. But psychogenic amnesia was a thing. What kid would want to remember being terrified in the woods for a week and a half? Not me, clearly. I started filling my closet with clothes and carefully lined up my shoes and boots. I should totally get a new pair to celebrate being home. I left the closet and began arranging my study things on the desk. We'd be starting back to school on Monday, after an inevitably busy weekend. The same private school we'd gone to before we left. That was the only thing I had mixed feelings about. There had just been such a fuss about my last disappearance, the one when I was 12. That one had been the real catalyst for everything. That had been when everything just... broke. Ooh, memory time. I'd been missing for nearly two full weeks. The newspapers were running dramatic and hopeless stories. There was speculation about whether I was a runaway, or if it was a ploy for attention. After all, it had happened to me before. There were search parties out every day looking for any sign of me. My parents were heartbroken. Again. Spencer was out with the search party one evening and got separated from them. They heard his scream and feared the worst. But he ran out of the woods a short time later in hysterics, clutching at one of his eyes. Then I walked out after him in a daze, but unharmed. One of his eyes? They never found anything wrong with his eye. He lost the vision in it, but no one knew the reason. He was saying a lot of crazy things at the time. No one knew if he'd hit his head or had maybe gotten attacked by a stray cougar. And again, I didn't remember a thing. There was a lot of public interest in the incident due to the fact that it was the second one involving our family, and me specifically. People loved mysteries, and I had given them one. If I wasn't making it up, and I wasn't, then what sort of trauma could give me amnesia twice? No one could do anything but speculate. Endlessly. My family tried to just get on with life, but it hadn't been easy. More like... impossible. There had just been too much stupid speculation and skepticism. At school, there were rumors that we'd both done the whole thing for attention, and Spencer's injury was fake. That he had a psychotic episode and tried to kill me. It was a mess. And so we just left. Ugh. Why am I even thinking about this again? Because you're back! It's bringing up old memories. I shook off all those old negative thoughts. It was years ago. People had forgotten. Everything was going to be fine. I stacked the empty boxes off to the side. On the opposite side of the room, I set up my painting things. The cabinet for my art supplies was nearby, and I quickly stacked everything inside. The sunny room was going to be perfect for painting. It even faced north. I loved that they remembered that when they picked this room for me. Mariposa, are you finished yet? I'm nearly done. Give me a few more minutes. I turned my attention to my small library of old books. I had all the classics, all used and worn and beautiful. And, of course, there was lots of Shakespeare. It only took a few minutes to get the books on the shelves. I try to organize them properly tomorrow. Once I was finished unpacking, I gave my room a satisfied once-over before heading downstairs to help Mom unpack the kitchen. What should I do with the boxes in my room? We'll have to figure out what the recycling pickup schedule is so we can crush them and set them out. For now, just leave them. Okay. Meanwhile, can you set these out on the back porch? She motioned to a few large empty flower pots near the table. No problem. When you're back, I have a few things for you to take to the basement. Yay. Come on, hurry it up. Aye, Captain. I hefted the stack of pots and managed to wobble my way to the back door with them. Navigating the door handle was a bit interesting, but I managed to get outside without breaking anything. I set them down near one of the brick columns and looked across the overgrown backyard. Something interesting caught my eye and I hopped off the porch to go investigate. 
At the back, in a little hollowed out area near the fence, was a large ring of white mushrooms with round caps. A fairy ring! I smiled as I crouched down and poked one of them. We'd had one at our last house, too. How interesting. Dad had tried everything to get rid of it, but it was very persistent. No matter what he treated it with, it always came back. He wouldn't be happy about it, but for some reason I liked having it there. Aww. We got our first CG. So pretty. I smiled slightly, remembering playing with Spencer in our previous backyard. We'd play tag, and whoever made it inside the circle first would be safe. Or we'd lay inside it and pretend we could see the fairies dancing on the mushroom tops or playing in the tree branches. <sighs> I'm so glad to be back. What are you doing out here? <sighs> I stood carefully brushing off my jeans. Why does he always have to sound so angry? Mom has more work for you to do. You know, if you have time between daydreaming and communing with nature. Is it possible for you to speak to me like I'm a human being? It would be if I was sure you were a human being. I hated the way he always said things like that with a completely straight face. Ha ha. Very amusing. I assure you that sisters are indeed human. Brothers, however, I'm not sure about. Normally one would assume he hadn't meant it literally, but I could never tell with him. Just get back inside. As he turned away, he snapped a foot out, kicking over a few of the mushrooms. Ugh. I'm gonna stay calm. Why did he always try to ruin things just because I liked them? I wanted to get angry, but then we just fight, and I didn't want to fight with him anymore. It took all my self-control to swallow down the irritation. I stared at the broken fairy ring and bit my lower lip. You know, in stories, fairies tend to get pretty ticked off if you mess with their stuff. A strange look passed over his face, sort of confused and fearful at once. What the... Because... it's a fairy ring? That's what a circular formation of mushrooms is called? Whatever. He stalked back inside, leaving me by the broken fairy ring. An interesting reaction from him. I looked down at the crumbled mushrooms lying in broken bits on the grass. They'd grow back. It was stupid to care. I hated seeing something pretty messed up for a stupid reason. I hated that he had to ruin everything like some kind of creepy assassin of joy. I shoved my hands in my pockets and headed back inside. There was a quiet rustle of dried leaves behind me and I glanced back. There was nothing there. Or was there? Probably a squirrel or something. Casting one last glance at the fairy ring, I stepped back into the kitchen prepared for a list of chores to complete before dinner. I was just glad Dad was already talking about ordering pizza instead of trying to cook. That sounds sensible. That night I had a vivid dream, and it was the sense I was looking for something and that I had to find my way home. There were tall trees draped in emerald moss and groping branches that reached to the sun. There was faint singing. Childish voice vo voices. Childish voices whose words I couldn't make out. It was a dream that left the taste and smell of warm, wet earth in my mouth as I woke. The smell quickly faded and was replaced by that of bacon and eggs as sunlight warmed my eyelids, beckoning me, beckoning me to wake up. Ah, I like your sleeping top. And we have a date now. Saturday, October 9th. Mm. I rolled over and snuggled deep into my blankets. Mom was already up. I could hear her downstairs talking to Dad as she cooked breakfast. The prickle of sunlight against my eyelids coaxed me out of sleep and warmed my face. Mariposa! I know you want to sleep in, but we still have a lot of unpacking to do. I'm up. Sort of. The last remnants of my dream faded as I staggered out of bed into my closet to rummage for something to wear. It was a dream I'd had many times, though not for a while. For that sense of having to get home, I assumed it was a dream from when I'd gotten lost in the woods. From when I'd gotten spirited away, as my grandmother always called it. Being back must have been dredging up some of the old feelings from back then. I glanced toward my half-open curtains. It looks a bit chilly this morning. I should probably find something warm. This far north, it always felt like summer simply stopped abruptly, giving way to instant autumn. Yesterday, when we had arrived, it had been sunny with a hint of chill. 
But I was betting the mornings were pretty cold. <laughs> hey, mom says to stop fooling around and get your butt downstairs. I nearly jumped out of my skin when he just walked into my room. In response, I snatched a stray sock and threw it his way. I'm getting dressed, you creep. Then shut the door. Fine. I marched across the room to slam the door in Spencer's face. I threw my clothes on and wrangled my curly hair into some semblance of a ponytail. Not exactly the height of stylishness, but we still had unpacking to do and Mom could be a slave driver. Function over fashion or whatever. I got downstairs in time to see Mom setting out the plates. First breakfast in the new house. Wow, you really went all out. Bacon, eggs, even pancakes. And glorious, glorious coffee. Dad walked by munching on something and Mom scowled at him. Sit at the table if you want to eat. <laughs> that face. Too busy. He reached for another piece of bacon, but she slapped his hand. He just grinned at her. As soon as she turned away, he grabbed the bacon and shoved it in his mouth and fled the room. I rolled my eyes at them and was about to sit when Mom yanked my breakfast away ruthlessly. What? Uh-uh. She pointed to several garbage bags in a box by the door. Uh-oh. You said you'd take them out last night and didn't. The bags go to the bins out front and the box goes to the tool shed out back. Both of them. Before breakfast. Mom, I'm hungry. I crave sustenance. I made sad, whiny noises and pawed at her from my plate. She wasn't buying it. Spencer swung by the table and took my plate out of her hands, snatching a slice of bacon off it and shoving it in his mouth. Like father, like son. Thanks, Mom. Looks delicious. That's mine, just so you know. He sidled past me, holding the plate just out of reach. There's plenty of food. Take the trash out, then you can eat. You are so mean. All of you. It was useless to argue. I already knew that. I trudged to the door, fumbling with a pair of flip-flops there before picking my poison and heading out. Um, I want to go and check on the fairy ring. I hope you know that this is cruel and unusual punishment. It's not punishment. Just fulfilling obligations. Cruel! I barely got the last word in before the door slammed shut. She was big about obligations and responsibilities, but it wasn't too bad, I guess. Dad was way worse. I wrangled the box back to the tool shed at the far corner of the backyard. What's even in this thing? It must have been tools and stuff since it was heading to the shed. Mom should seriously just get rid of them anyway. Dad was a menace with anything sharp or connected to a power source. He was a businessman to the core, but a handyman? Not so much. Disaster always ensued the moment he got his hands on tools. I waded through the weeds to the tool shed, noticing that all the flower beds were still full of wilted bulbs. It needed some major cleanup. I glanced at the fairy ring when I passed it. New mushrooms had already popped up to replace the one Spencer kicked over. Hooray. It always impressed me how fast those things could grow. I smiled to myself. The shed was bolted shut, and I wondered if anyone had even tried to open it yet. If there are spiders in there, I will definitely scream. I'm out. I set the box down and looked all around the bolt to check for creepy crawlies, especially those huge intimidating orb weavers. A door slammed at the next house over. I glanced over instinctively, but of course the privacy fence blocked my view. Regardless, it was impossible to avoid eavesdropping on what seemed to be two young guys talking. Did you have to drag me out of bed so early for this? I was up half the night. You're always up half the night. Come on, exercise is good for you, and you asked me to help you with this. I know, I know. Two guys, for sure. One had a deep, warm voice, the other just sounded half asleep. I smiled as I finally slid the bolt over and shoved the door open. It sounded like two high schoolers, maybe around my age. I quickly dropped the box off to one side and stepped out of the shed before some gross, creepy crawly got on me. You know, with your skills, you should be great at this, so I'm not going to take it easy on you. Uh, hey, careful. There's no way I'm a match for your crazy. Just catch. Ooh! What? Um... What did you throw at my head? Ah! I wasn't quite sure what had just happened. 
I just stepped out of the shed, and suddenly I was on the ground seeing stars and trying to figure out what had just bounced off my head. It had looked vaguely football shaped, but who the heck throws like that? Oh my god, are you okay? I blinked rapidly and looked around. Okay, now I'm hearing voices descend from the sky. I probably have brain damage. Up here. All right. Someone was peering at me over the top of the wooden fence. Oh my, hello. Don't move, okay? I'm coming over. Lots of rustling and suspicious moments, uh, movements later, and a huge, dark-haired guy swung over a tree branch and into my yard. Uh, wow. Maybe it was just a blurred vision, but he was quite good-looking. Before I knew it, Mr. Tall, Dark, and Attractive was kneeling over me with a worried look on his face. I am so sorry. I didn't realize anyone would be back here and, well, my friend was supposed to catch that. He, uh, missed. Are you okay? I felt hands on my face as the boy tried to brush my bangs aside to get a look at my forehead. My cheeks instantly heated up. I made a feeble attempt to push his hands away as they ga grazed the painful bump forming. I'm fine. Seriously. I mean, you have a really good arm, but the stars and little birdies are fading, so I think I'll be fine. He gave me a really sweet, apologetic smile. This is definitely not how I plan to meet the new neighbors. He stood and offered me a hand, which I took to pull myself up. Well, there are worse ways to make an unforgettable first impression. Then again, given the size of the lump on my head, I may well forget this whole thing in a few minutes anyway. Ugh. I'm kidding. He breathed an almost comical sigh of relief. <sighs> Short of driving my car into your house, I can't imagine how this could get much worse. I'm Danny, by the way. And are you really okay? Mariposa, nice to meet you, and yes, I suspect the brain damage will be minimal. I'm really, really sorry. Hello, everything okay over there? Oh my, hello purple. Another head popped over the fence, this one belonging to a pale purple-haired boy. Definitely the sleepy head. Oh, hello there. This is my friend Elliot, though most people just call him Motsy. Motsy? He was supposed to catch that. <laughs> I smirked up at the boy dangling over the fence. Good job. He returned the smirk with a silly grin. Hey, playing catch with a quarterback this morning was not my idea. I am sorry, though. You have a huge bump on your head. I touched my forehead and winced. <sighs> yeah, that might need some ice. With luck, it'll get me out of helping unpack the kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> well, we try to be helpful. Next time, could you just pretend to bounce a ball off my head? I'm really, really sorry. I said it's okay. I still feel bad, though. It's fine. I'll live. With minimal brain damage. Most likely. Ahem. We both looked at the purple-haired guy who was still peering down at us from the fence. So, um, not to interrupt, but I was just wondering. I mean, I guess you'll be starting school around here soon? Yeah, on Monday. We're both seniors at Stone Circle Academy. You? Oh, cool! My brother and I are seniors, too. We'll be starting there on Monday. That's where we went before we moved. Nice. You used to live here? A few years ago, yeah. We're moving back to be closer to my grandparents. Gotcha. So you and your brother are in the same grade. Twins. You lucked out, though. I'm the good one. Spencer's... evil. You'll... What the hell, Mariposa? You're supposed to be helping out, not flirting with the locals. Ah, yes. Great timing as always, bro. Finish up out there and get back inside. Mom's looking for you. I glared at the house as Spencer's head of auburn curls vanished back into the kitchen. See? Evil. <laughs> Sorry to interrupt your unpacking with flirting, especially when it entails nearly knocking you unconscious. I'll make it up to you sometime. It's not a big deal. Though I wouldn't object if you aim for my brother's head next time instead. I mean, since you like being so helpful. I'll try. It was nice to meet you, Elliot, right? Yup, I guess I'll see you on Monday. 
Yeah. He vanished behind the fence again, leaving me alone with Danny. Um, mind if I go through the gate on my way out? <laughs> yeah, no problem. I showed him the way, then went back inside for an ice pack and breakfast. Mom spent a few minutes fussing over my head before setting my plate down in front of me and giving me the long list of chores I had to complete. It was going to be a long, long day. Hey, we made it through chapter one. Stone Circle Academy. I don't see them anywhere. They were on the counter last night. Where are they? How the heck should I know? You never let me drive, so I don't keep up with the car keys. You two are going to be late for your first day if you don't find them soon. Not my fault. Spencer was scour scouring the house looking for the car keys that he insisted he'd left on the counter. I was rinsing the breakfast dishes and Mom was... supervising. Spencer let out an exasperated groan from near the door where he was hunting around for the keys. Aww. Where's my other shoe? Oh my god, I don't know. I don't keep up with your stuff. I finished the dishes and wiped my hands, grabbing my book bag as I headed to the front door to see if Spencer had left the keys there instead. If I'm late because of you... We won't be late if you just help me find the keys. I wouldn't have to help you find them if you just keep up with your stuff. I stalked to the front to check the little shelf by the cabinet there. No keys. I don't know why I opened the cabinet to check inside, but when I pulled the door open, I was confronted by Spencer's worn-out tennis shoe. I blinked at it in surprise. What the? I snatched it out of the cabinet and stalked back to the kitchen. I could only imagine that my sleep-deprived mom had put it in there while doing the last of the unpacking. I wonder if Spencer had checked the fridge for the keys, yet. At this rate, it wouldn't surprise me if that's where they were. I found your stupid shoe. Spencer looked up from where he was rummaging through kitchen drawers for the keys. I tossed him the shoe, and as it somersaulted through the air to him, something flew out and hit the floor with a decidedly metallic sound. We both looked down in surprise. The car keys were sprawled carelessly on the kitchen floor. Uh, uh, what were the keys doing in his shoe? Spencer immediately glared at me. Don't look at me, I didn't put them there. Where did you find this? In the cabinet by the front door. I could tell exactly what he was thinking, but I just shrugged. Sorry, it wasn't me. I don't know why your shoe was there, but I'm not in the mood to hear you blame me for it. <sighs> he just scoffed as he set the shoe down and shoved his foot in it. He snatched the keys off the floor. Yeah, right. Mom hurried back into the kitchen. We found them. Someone put them in the front cabinet. I know, don't ask me. Maybe Dad did it. Whatever, someone probably just wasn't paying attention. You two need to leave now. You still have to stop and check in at the office before class. She practically shoved us both through the door. And thus came the quiet, uncomfortable drive to school. Yay. Spencer was driving our shared car, and I was sitting quietly in the passenger seat because fighting over who got to drive just wasn't worth it. I hated riding with him, though, but had no choice on that point. <clears throat> Hold on a second. Sorry about that, something got caught in my throat. I was hoping after catching up with a couple of old friends, I might be able to start bumming a ride with one of them. In the meantime, though... So, looking forward to your first day? We might not get along, but I hated awkward silences almost as much as fighting. It should not have been this painful to ride in the car with my brother for ten minutes. Hmm. Ah, oh, yes. Typical Spencer response. Kurt. Krippik. Kripp Krippik? Yes. Cryptic. Utterly useless for conversation. I take that as a no. Depends how many classes I have with you. Ugh. Really? Can we not start the day like this? Then can you not talk to me? I bit my lip and stared out the window. It would have been nice if we could have, I don't know, supported each other or something? Like actual siblings? We are going to be best siblings. I know being back has probably brought up some bad memories. I know that you're still angry at me. He didn't say anything. 
But if we could just talk about it. We can't talk about it. I winced as he started yelling. Ugh. This was a bad plan. You try to act so innocent when mom and dad are around. You try to go on as if nothing happened because you've forgotten. Some of us can't just forget. I never said I forgot. I said I can't remember. It might have been silly to make a distinction, but the way he used the word forgotten made it sound too deliberate somehow. I leveled a serious look at him. If I recall, you told everyone you couldn't remember either. He didn't look at me. I was sitting on the side with his bad eye, so he didn't even bother. What was I supposed to tell them? No one believed me when I told them the truth. What truth? All I remember you telling people was... was... I stopped myself and looked out the window. The unfinished sentence hung on the air between us. What was it? I didn't have to finish it for us to both understand how strange it sounded. Of course no one had believed him. He told them I was some kind of monster, that I wasn't even his real sister. Changeling. Who in their right mind would believe that anyway? Don't try to act like you don't remember what really happened. I know better. He said it so quietly I almost missed it. I just kept staring at the passing trees and didn't reply. I had no idea what I was supposed to remember. Turning into a monster? Somehow magically stealing his vision? It had been years since he'd last said something that out of touch with reality. Was I supposed to believe he actually still thought something like that was true? If that was the case, I didn't even know how to respond. I chewed my lip anxiously, regretting talking to him. That was good. You got some stuff out into the air. You need to do that. A few minutes later, we were pulling into the school parking lot. As soon as we found his face, Spencer jumped out and went straight inside. I grabbed my stuff and slammed the door, pausing to take a deep breath. I was not letting him ruin my day. Or I'd try not to, anyway. By the time I got inside, he was already walking out of the office with his schedule in hand. He didn't even look at me. I guess that was his way of letting me know I was on my own today. Not that I expected anything else. It didn't take long to get my own schedule printed. As I left the office still looking it over, I heard a long, familiar squeal heading my way. I couldn't keep the grin off my face when I saw Allie Fisher, the one person I'd kept in touch with the last five years, barreling toward me. Mariposa! I just saw Spencer! Dang! He's pretty. I didn't think he gets so tall. Ew. That's the first thing you're going to say to me when we finally see each other again? Also, that's not tall. You tower over him with a good set of heels. Oh, come on. He's not my brother. I'm allowed to admire him. She grinned and grabbed my arm, pulling me away from the office and down the hall. You're gross. And your crush on him is super weird. Nope! Like I said, I'm allowed. Allie, trust me when I say this. You can do better. No, no. I don't think so. In fact, I'm thinking later today I need to catch up with Spencer a bit. I say again? You. <laughs> she just laughed at my discomfort. I couldn't keep the smile off my face as we walked together. We'd kept in touch, but this was my first time actually seeing her in a long time. So, how's the unpacking going? I was going to call this weekend, but I figured you'd be busy. We're nearly done. Mom's been a total slave driver. It's kind of crazy. <laughs> I remember how she is. I actually thought about coming over to help, but, well, then I remembered how she is. You're the worst friend. No, I'm a great friend. And I'm super glad you're back. This is going to be a great year. I'm glad to be back, too. Though, before anything else, I do have to warn you about... I heard you were back in town. That voice. I shot Allie a look and she gave me an apologetic smile in return. So this was what she was going to warn me about. Oh my. Kara, my other friend from Pine Hollow. Hope you managed to stick around for the full year. Wouldn't want you to end up getting lost again as soon as you get back in town. Well, there goes the idea that people have forgotten about that. I don't intend to get lost anywhere. Oh, I don't intend to get lost anywhere. If you want to, though, I can definitely give you directions. 
From beside me, Allie snickered quietly, but said nothing. <laughs> I really couldn't believe Kara was still bitter over that incident. I got that my last disappearance had disrupted her little concert, and that she and her mother had always had big aspirations regarding her musical career. But it's not like I'd ruin things on purpose, and I hadn't exactly asked everyone to ditch the concert and join the manhunt for me. I knew it had to have sucked, but I had apologized, and I was getting tired of apologizing for something I couldn't even fully remember. Anyway, they're pretty strict on attendance these days. The teachers aren't too keen on people who just take off for attention whenever they want, so you might want to be careful. No one is going to believe convenient amnesia either. Not this time. She walked past with a glare aimed my way. <sighs> well then. What a thing to come back to. My family had moved away before we'd had the chance to work things out, but maybe I should have tried to mend fences with her before we got back. To be fair, I hadn't expected her to still be mad. As it was, that was just another thing to feel guilty for. At the very least, I was sorry that her relationship with Allie soured because of me as well. They clearly weren't exactly buddies anymore either. Sorry about that. I was just getting around to warning you about her. She's been cranky ever since she heard you were moving back. Allie pulled me down the hall in the opposite direction of Kara. Don't apologize. I can't believe she's mad. Normal people don't get mad about things like that. Well, you know she thinks I was trying to mess things up for her intentionally because I was jealous. Or whatever. That's ridiculous. Maybe, but she wasn't the only one. Half the town thought it was just some cry for attention, remember? Oh, whatever. Anyone who knew you at the time should have known better. That includes Kara. That's when Spencer started hating me too. So maybe they know something I don't. I gave her a tired smile. Come on, perk up. You can't look all grumpy on your first day. I know, I know. So, what's your first class? Literature. Mrs. Roberts. Same! I was relieved. Being around someone who actually wanted me there might make my morning suck a little less. You'll love her. Come on! She dragged me the rest of the way to class. I like Allie. Life is all about making... Something, something, and learning from them. Ah, life is all about making mistakes and learning from them. Okay, my eyes aren't as terrible as I thought. I immediately scanned for certain unfriendly faces, but was relieved that neither Spencer nor Kara was anywhere to be seen. I did see some other familiar faces, though. Oh, it's Danny and Elliot! They were sitting at the far side of the room, surrounded by a group of friends who seemed to be taking great pleasure in prodding Elliot awake every time he nodded off. Well, we found our Jeremy. He is definitely not a morning person. Elliot's purple hair and black clothes stuck out like a sore thumb among Danny and the rest of the clean-cut sporty guys. I got the feeling Danny was the main reason he was in that group. Unlike Elliot, who looked out of place, Danny fit in perfectly. I couldn't help but wonder how those two had become friends. They were so different. Um, hmm. Well, if it's me being myself, I would go introduce myself to the teacher. I made a mental note to catch up with them both later. Before I could get much further into the class, Allie grabbed my arm and started dragging me toward where the teacher was waiting at the front of the room. Come on, I'll introduce you before class starts. I'm coming, please don't rip my arm off. Allie introduced me to Mrs. Roberts, who gave me a quick rundown of what the class was studying at the moment. A Midsummer Night's Dream, I'd read it last year, actually, so catching up wouldn't be that difficult. We have an empty seat at the front of the class and several at the back. You may take your pick. She shot me a friendly smile that made me feel quite at ease. I suspected that I'd like her. And welcome back to Stone Circle, Miss Price. Thanks. I'm really glad to be back. Unfortunately, none of the seating options were near people I knew, which was a little disappointing. It looks like she has everyone paired up for group work. The seat up at the front was next to a sort of grumpy-looking, well-dressed blonde. He didn't look... extremely friendly. That guy is 100% a vampire. <laughs> I don't know why. He just... I, like, he, he looks really pale, but then I looked at my character and she's pretty pale too, but there's just something about him that screams vampire to me. 
There were also two empty sets of pear desks at the back, and one open seat next to a gloomy boy with messy brown hair. He didn't even look up at, as Mrs. Roberts explained my choices. Aw, he's cute. The only other seat was on the second to last row by the window. It was tempting, to be honest, but... I should probably take a seat that at least gives me a reading partner. But both options just looked like so much fun. Well, vampire boy. <laughs> I didn't want to make a terrible impression on Mrs. Roberts, especially considering literature was one of my favorite subjects. I opted for the seat in the front and just hoped the blonde wasn't as cranky as he looked. <clears throat> I smiled a little nervously as I slid into the chair next to him. His eyes swept over me, lingering for just a few seconds on my face before he looked away. He didn't say anything or introduce himself. Friendly. Today we'll be continuing our reading of A Midsummer's Night's Dream with your partners. Mark, if you would be so good as to share your book with Mariposa today. I heard an almost inaudible sigh from the boy next to me. <sighs> to his credit, he tried for a gracious smile. He got an A for effort, but it didn't quite reach his eyes. I sighed inwardly. Maybe I should have just taken the seat at the back. He was clearly rather put out at having to deal with me, but it was too late to pick up and move now. I just had to make the best of it. Mark pushed his playbook between us and turned his chair slightly toward mine. I hope you don't mind sharing with me for today. He sounded slightly less annoyed than he looked. I was hoping that was a good sign. I don't mind. Mrs. Roberts will likely have your reading material ready for you by tomorrow. It's not a problem. I studied this play last year, so I think I still remember a good bit of it. Besides that, it was in my selection of Shakespearean works, and I'd read it multiple times. I see. I have some trouble retaining Shakespeare and pinning down the larger themes in his works, so perhaps you'd be willing to help me with that. Since we started this unit, my scores haven't been as good as they could be. Oh, no problem. I love Shakespeare, so I'm really familiar with his style and all. I don't mind helping. Maybe I was wrong about him being cranky. He seems... nicer than I expected? I see. In that case, I'll be looking forward to your expert opinions as we read. Something about the way he said that made it sound more like sarcasm. I chose not to respond. At least for now. No reason to make a bad impression on the first day. I nervously tucked my hair behind my ear and leaned closer to look at the book. Even if he's being sarcastic, he's not going to find a better study partner than me. So there. As I leaned toward him, I couldn't help but notice the expensive-looking watch on his left wrist. Not to mention his clothes and... Actually, everything he wore sort of reeked of money. There was nothing wrong with that. But now that I was leaning so close to him, I realized money apparently reeked like really, really nice cologne. You know, the kind that made you want to bury your face in someone's neck and just melt into them? Yeah. Ah, oh, yeah, I love that cologne. <laughs> I tried to not let it distract me. Down, girl. You are not going to make a good impression on anyone if you start sniffing people on the first day. <laughs> uh, big mood. I had no idea how I was going to focus on reading when sitting next to him was apparently going to be a constant heavenly assault on my olfactory sense. Because it was hard not to pay attention to the cologne. At least from this distance. Mark was definitely from a wealthy family. He wouldn't be the only one at the academy, that was for sure. But most didn't wear their wealth so obviously. Then again, he probably didn't think he was being obvious about it or anything. <clears throat> so, where did you leave off reading last time? I was just beginning Act 3. Then we'll just pick up there. Naturally. Come to think of it, I had to wonder why he was sitting alone if he had so much trouble with the subject. Especially when there was another person in the class with no partner. Maybe Mark's original partner moved or something? Or his original partner couldn't stop themselves from smelling him and then got... They're like, um, I think you might need a timeout. As I shifted to look at the far page of text, my elbow brushed against Mark's arm. I had barely touched him, but he jumped slightly and jerked himself away, moving his arm awkwardly across his desk as if to get it completely out of my airspace. 
S sorry? What is that about? When I glanced up at him, his brows were knit together, eyes practically boring a hole into the book. It's alright. His tone was terse, and he didn't look up when he spoke. I raised an eyebrow as I studied him. Sure, some people weren't keen on physical contact, but that had been a little dramatic. Maybe you burned him. Alrighty then. Moving on, I guess. So this is where Bottom and the others are rehearsing, right? Mark nodded, but said nothing else. A man a few words, I see. For the next 45 minutes, we took turns reading. He stumbled over the lines, frowning intensely at the playbook the entire time. He said he'd, been, he'd be looking forward to my expert opinions, but he didn't exactly give a chance for me to share them. He wasn't really unfriendly, but he was definitely keeping his distance. Literally. From the moment I touched his arm, he did his best to stay well out of my personal space. Or keep me out of his, maybe. Awkwardly so, actually. It was to the point of him noticeably leaning away from me while we read. Hmm. <laughs> so sorry I offended you, your highness. I take back what I thought about your heavenly cologne, so there. The bell eventually rang, eliciting a sigh of relief from us both. <sighs> Mark immediately stood and slid his books into a leather satchel. He nodded stiffly and headed out of the class. I watched him go, curious about what his deal was. He was standoffish and acted like I'd nearly burned his flesh off just by brushing his arm. Because you're a fairy and he's a vampire and your love is forbidden. Mysterious. <laughs> was he shy? Did he just not like commoners like myself? Maybe you were still sniffing him and he was uncomfortable with that. Maybe I smell weird to him. I resisted the urge to sniff my sleeve just to be sure. Well, whatever. It was just one guy in one class. He could be as unsociable as he wanted. I checked my class schedule and groaned as I realized trigonometry was next. I'd have to ask Allie about Mark later. Knowing her, she'd probably have tons of juicy details to share. I was pretty sure trigonometry was on the same floor as literature, but it had been several years since I was last here and I'd never actually come to the high school wing. I wasn't entirely sure where I was going. Why is it so crowded? I was jostled across the hall by the crowd trying to aim for a nearly empty spot by an open door. I reached out at the same time as a pale-haired girl in a blue coat. We nearly ran into each other, but she caught me by the so shoulders, preventing an embarrassing collision. Oh, hello. Careful. Wait. That voice. That's a guy? I was looking and I'm like, I'm pretty sure that's a... I thought, like, if I had just seen that without her saying, oh, it's a lady, I would have thought it was a guy. Then it turns out, it is a guy. Okay. Glad my anim anime eyes are still working perfectly fine. <laughs> I stared up at him somewhat in awe. He was so pretty. How could a guy be that pretty? He smiled down at me. Are you okay? I didn't mean to nearly crash into you. Oh, yes, sorry. I'm okay. I quickly straightened and tried to get my bearings. I don't remember it being this- Watch it! Someone very nearly sheared my nose off with his backpack. I don't think they even heard me shout. Is it always this crowded between classes? Jeez. Ugh. Hey, can I ask you where- Wish me luck. Before I could finish, the boy bounded away from the hall and- Oh no. I squeezed my eyes shut as he nearly bowled over two brunettes twice his size. I expected him to bounce off and go sprawling, but he somehow managed to dodge and bowl over someone smaller than him instead. Sorry, I'm so sorry. Are you okay? I watched him fuss over the girl for a few seconds before hurrying off down the hall, squeezing his way through the crowd. He seemed pretty popular. Everyone waved and called to him as he bounced through. It didn't take long to learn that his name was Corbin, if only because people kept shouting it as they said hello. That's an unusual name. As I, got right, as I got ready to brave the tide of students myself, I noticed a book had fallen in the middle of the hallway, right where Corvin had run into that girl. Oh shoot, did he drop that? No one else appeared to have noticed it there. I hesitated for a moment. I didn't want to just leave it, but I was really doubtful of my ability to get across the hall and pick something up off the floor without getting steamrolled by the crowd. And I was going to be late if I waited until the hall cleared to get it. 
Still, it was going to get damaged if I just left it in the middle of the floor. I should probably either return it to Corvin or get it to the office. Uh, dive in, girl. Someone clipped the edge of the book with their foot as they walked past, sending it sliding across the tile toward the end of the lockers. I couldn't watch anymore. At this rate, it would be ruined. I shifted my backpack slightly and practically threw myself into the crowd. If Pretty Boy could do it, so could I. Probably. It wasn't quite as easy as he made it seem, probably because he was at least six inches taller than me. Not that I was short or anything, it was just really crowded. I jostled my way through the hur hurried students, nearly losing an eye to a wayward backpack at least once. When I was finally near the other side of the hall, I made a sort of dive around the corner for the book. A head of white blonde hair came into my field of view a few seconds too late. <laughs> I wasn't able to halt my momentum before our skulls cracked against each other. <laughs> wow, a magical band-aid appears. Oof. Ah! I crouched on the floor, seeing stars as I clutched my head. Man, I'm really clumsy for hitting my head against things. Pretty boy was back. And his head must have been made of titanium. Jeez. Maybe I need to start wearing a helmet. Yeah. Ow. Oh my god, are you okay? Are you okay? I didn't see you. Wow, he was two for two when it came to running into me at this point. If he kept this up, I was going to have to start considering the possibility that either he and I were soulmates, or I'd somehow become magnetized in the last ten minutes. I blinked rapidly, waiting for my vision to come back fully before I answered. A pair of large hands closed on my shoulders and started shaking me. Don't shake someone when they, like, maybe have a concussion. Are you alright? Can you see me? Do I need to get you to the office? Uh, please stop shaking me. Sorry. You just weren't answering, so I was worried. I rode my forehead and peered at the blonde boy with one eye. We stared at each other for a long time. He really had the most amazing green eyes. Shoot, I dropped my glasses. He suddenly started looking around wildly for the glasses that were right by his knee. I picked them up and handed them over. He shoved them onto his face and looked at me again, smiling this time. I think you dropped a book earlier. I was trying to get it so I could return it to you. Oh yeah, I just came back for it, and... He blinked suddenly, giving me another long look. When did you see me drop it? Earlier when you ran into that girl. Right, right. It was kind of crowded, though. You must have a good eye. Well, I was watching since we'd nearly run into each other, and you sort of geronimo out into the crowd right after. Oh yeah. We nearly ran into each other over there, too. I guess our meeting was meant to be. Thanks for trying to save my book. That was sweet. He shoved it into his backpack before standing and offering me his hand. I took it and pulled myself to my feet, if only because I was still a bit dizzy from that epic headbutt. Thanks. He didn't immediately let go of my hand, but instead pulled me slightly closer, peering very seriously into my eyes. Some of these supernatural boys are getting a weird vibe from me, aren't they? <laughs> whoa, 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 I'm blushing. I felt my face heating up un again under his scrutiny. What's your name? I... I'm Mariposa. I tried to pull my hand away and he instantly released it, smiling slightly. He reached up and gently brushed my hair away from my cheek. This is too much for my heart. <laughs> Well, I'm glad to have met you, Mariposa. Before he could say much else, he was called away by another boy and darted off, leaving me staring after him. Whoa. Just... What was that? Holding hands with someone on the first day, I'm impressed. I shook myself out of that daze and glared at Allie. We weren't holding hands, he was helping me stand. Right, right. Whoa! What happened to your head? Oh, that guy. I think his name's Corvin. He and I sort of ran into each other. Do I have another huge bump again? Nice. Yeah, if you're going to find a crazy way to introduce yourself to a guy, going with something classic works. Yeah, I did not bash my head into his just to meet him. Right, right. But he's pretty cute, yeah? I rolled my eyes. 
Whatever. Can you show me where Trig is before we're both late? Uh, you still suck with directions. Come on! My next two classes were fairly boring. At least when it came to academic content. When it came to social interaction, though, it was definitely a different story. First of all, Cor Corvin was in trigonometry. Or tri tri trigometry? Is it trigometry? Have I been saying it wrong all this time? Blech. He didn't seem to notice me at all, though. Not that I was surprised. I had definitely been right about him being popular. He was surrounded by others before class started. The crowd around Danny and literature was nothing compared to the amount of people vying for Corvin's attention. It was a little weird, actually. On top of that, he was a complete and total klutz. He dropped his pencil a dozen times, tripped over his own feet, and at one point somehow landed on another student's desk face first. At most schools, he probably would have been a laughing stock, but not so much here. In fact, the other students sort of fawned over him every time he hurt himself. Three different people offered to escort him to the nurse for an ice pack after he fell. He was kind of an airhead, but I guess he must have been really, really nice to have that many friends and admirers. It was probably cynical to think it might just be the way he hemorrhaged compliments. Corvin's antics aside, Spencer was in both trig and chemistry. I couldn't help but wonder how having two classes with me must have impacted how good a day he was having. And if watching him alternate between glaring and pretending I didn't exist wasn't bad enough... Kara was also in chemistry with us. Why do I get the feeling Kara will be our brother's girlfriend? The moment she saw me and gave me a smug little grin, I knew something was up. So I was a little apprehensive going into class. It was sad we hadn't managed to patch things up, but I was ultimately okay with her not liking me. I wasn't okay with her trying to pick fights and cause problems just for the sake of doing it, though. And it didn't take long to work out what she was up to. I hadn't even gotten to my desk when two people who introduced themselves as Luke and Emery practically set up camp nearby to pepper me with questions about the whole childhood disappearing act. Yeah, I mean, it makes sense she wants to get her version of the story out there before I have any say in it. I didn't remember either of them, so I didn't think they were students who were at the school when it happened. And yet, they'd definitely gotten a pretty detailed version of what had happened from somewhere. Damn it, Kara. Oh, hello, everyone. So, do you really not remember what happened to you while you were missing? I heard you were attacked by a bear or something. Someone said you were the only witness to a murder out there, but none of the other victims were ever found. Do you think you blocked it all out because of the trauma? Is it true the police questioned you guys because they thought you tried to kill each other? I shot Spencer a quick look at that one. Is that how you got injured or whatever? Spencer was gritting his teeth, glaring at me. Uh, not good. I could practically see the red flashing light above his head declaring a level 7 nuclear event was imminent. Um... Is there any way we can just not talk about this? Come on, we're just curious. <sighs> I tried to figure out a diplomatic way to tell them to shut the heck up before my brother had a meltdown. It was a really long time ago. We just got back into town and are trying to settle in. There isn't much to tell anyway, but I think we'd rather not talk about it all the same. Everyone, please take your seats. At the teacher's words, everyone reluctantly retreated, leaving Spencer and me alone. I was trying to look anywhere but at him. I honestly hadn't expected anyone to bring this stuff up again. My gaze fell on Kara, who was still giving me that same smile. She giving me them Abigail vibes. Of course, if someone was intentionally trying to bring it all up again, then it was no wonder people were interested. <sighs> trying to stir rumors up using that, of all things, was literally the most pointless endeavor. Fortunately, by the time class released, everyone seemed more interested in getting to the cafeteria before the lines got too long. Or maybe the average student's attention span wasn't long enough to remember that Spencer and I had an interesting backstory. Regardless, the class emptied quickly, which left me to find my way to the cafeteria alone. Fortunately, it didn't take, fl take me long. I just had to follow the smell of old hot dogs and sweaty feet. Allie was nowhere in sight, so I just grabbed a sandwich and found an empty spot to eat alone. Yay. I barely sat down when someone else plunked a tray of food down directly across from me. Oh! I looked up hoping to see Allie, but instead saw the messy-haired boy from literature. Oh. What was his name again? We didn't introduce ourselves, did we? 
So sorry this is where I usually sit. They don't like it if I sit somewhere else. They? You mean your friends? Are they coming too? Should I move? He looked down at me with gentle brown eyes and a serious expression. No, no one else is coming. Then who are the they you were referring to? I didn't ask that though and he just sat down quietly and started eating without looking at me. I studied him surreptitiously while trying to eat. He was a little disheveled and gloomy. He definitely seemed shy or maybe just socially awkward. I wasn't sure which. He definitely wasn't much for talking though. A heavy silence descended on us. I lamented silently about how much I hated awkward silences. So, um, I'm Mariposa. We had one class together, so it couldn't hurt to at least properly introduce myself, right? William. When he looked up, I was startled by the sad look on his face. <laughs> this piano music! It's good that you didn't sit by me in class. You shouldn't sit here tomorrow either. W what the heck? Who says that kind of thing? Why would he even say something like that out of nowhere? I couldn't help but wonder if it was because of Kara stirring things up. Who knew what all she had been saying to people? How do I even respond to that? I just looked away, biting my lip to stop myself from saying something unnecessarily angry. I guess I won't. I sat silently for a few minutes before I stood abruptly and grabbed the tray with my sandwich. I wasn't sure why people were so intent on being jerks to me on my first day, but I wasn't really in the mood to put up with it anymore. But if I stayed, saying something unnecessarily angry was inevitable. I'm done. Bye. He wasn't trying to insult you, though. <laughs> William jumped to his feet. I'm sorry, I didn't mean it that way. I just... With a sudden jolt, my lunch tray flipped out of my hands. Bread and sandwich guts went flying everywhere as it cartwheeled through the air before slamming into the floor and skidding about ten feet. I stared after it in shock. I'm sorry. I shouldn't have. I'm sorry. You should stay away from me. What are you? He picked up his things and fled the room, leaving me standing there gaping at the mess on the floor. He hadn't hit the tray, and I definitely hadn't thrown it. What? just happened. The entire cafeteria was dead quiet. I could practically feel their eyes on me. Even Spencer was staring from across the room. Our eyes met, and it's not like I was expecting him to ask if I was okay or anything, but he just calmly went back to eating as if he didn't know me. I left the mess on the floor and ran out of the cafeteria already so over the day. Nothing was going the way I thought it would, and now I'm going to be starving. I don't have lunch. The rest of my day was surprisingly uneventful. I only had to talk about my incidents in, well, every single class, and it was the same battery of questions every time. Did I really lose my memory? What did I really see in the woods? Why did Spencer get questioned by the police? Did he really get attacked by an animal or was it me? Did I see a murder? Was I abducted by aliens? I still couldn't believe someone actually asked me the last one. In a non-ironic way, I made a mental note to stay far, far away from that kid. I couldn't avoid talking about it every time. Some students were relentless. Eventually, I just settled into the same rote answers. Yes, I really lost my memory. No, I don't know what I saw, but I was pretty sure it wasn't a murder. The police were trying to cover all their bases, but Spencer had nothing to do with it. He really was attacked by something, but it wasn't me. And as far as I was aware, no aliens were involved. Most people opted to leave me alone when they realized they weren't going to get any juicy details out of me, so otherwise there were no major problems. At any rate, no one else decided to be blatantly rude to me. What I really wanted to do was grab Allie and talk to her about what happened at lunch, but I didn't get a chance. I mean, she knew that guy better than I did. At the very least, she could tell me if it was just me or if they treated everyone that way. But we didn't have any afternoon classes together, and I hadn't seen her in the hall either. It was a little lonely, to be honest. Especially since the day was such a mixed bag. I knew I'd settle in. I knew the rumors would die out no matter how much Kara or anyone else tried to stir them up. There was just nothing to really talk about anyway. I knew first days were usually kind of rough. But I couldn't deny I'd been hoping for better. 
My head was pounding by the time I made my way to my locker and dumped the last of my newly assigned textbooks in it. I stood quietly for a moment, head leaning against the side as I geared myself up for the tense ride home. Hey, Mariposa. I turned hesitantly at the sound of my name, but sighed in relief when it was only Elliot. Someone I doubted was going to pick a fight or interrogate me. I gave him a tired smile. Whoa, you okay? You look, you know, kinda pale. Are you feeling sick? I'm fine. You sure? You're looking kind of anemic. I'm not anemic, just tired. It was a long day. Yeah, I heard. Uh, I mean, a lot of people were talking about you and your brother all day. Yeah, tell me about it. I slammed my locker door and hefted my book bag to my shoulder. I also saw what happened at lunch. Yeah. About that. It's fine. It's not a big deal. I'm not mad at anyone over that. Are you sure? Yeah. Like I said, it wasn't a big deal. Okay, just don't take it personally, okay? Everyone here has their stories, know what I mean? I suppose I should know that better than anyone. And don't worry about people talking about you. I mean, they'll stop. Soon. Probably. Encouraging. <laughs> well, I couldn't complain. He was trying to cheer me up, and that was sweet. I'm sure they will. I rubbed my head and gave him another exhausted smile. I should go. The evil twin is probably already waiting impatiently for me. Okay. I have a club meeting I need to get to. I really hope you feel better. Um, have fun at your club. Okay, well, have fun at your club then. Maybe I should try to enter a club too. It's not really the sort of club you have fun at usually, but I'll try. He waved and darted off down the hall toward the stairwell. What sort of club isn't meant for fun? I wondered if the office had a list of clubs I could register for. Of course. I'd have to coordinate with Spencer or get a ride from someone, so I might want to wait until I was a little more settled in. But it might be nice to get involved in something during my last year. At any rate, I made my way outside, keeping an eye out for Spencer as I went. I wasn't looking forward to the drive home at all, but this time I just stay quiet. I don't think I can handle another argument today. My nerves were already pretty frayed. I jogged across the front lawn toward the parking lot in spite of my head. If anything, Spencer complaining that I'd made him wait would just make my headache worse anyway. I immediately spotted the car, and it looked like Spencer was already waiting. I picked up the pace. When I got home, I was just going to go upstairs and immediately crash. And sleep! Wait, what is he doing? I was still at least 20 yards from him, so why was Spencer already backing out of the parking space? You jerk! Does he not see me? I waved one arm as I ran, wondering if he thought I was getting a ride with Allie or something. I froze mid-wave as he pulled out of the space, looked right at me, and drove off. Are you kidding me? I hope our parents do something about this. I very nearly threw my backpack on the ground and had a tantrum right there in full view of everyone. What a day. Yanking my phone out, I sent him a flurry of angry texts. I would text mom and dad. What are you doing? You looked right at me. Hello? Are you coming back to get me? Stop ignoring me. Ten minutes later, there was still no answer. I tried calling twice, but he didn't pick up. Tears of frustration stung my eyes as I clutched my backpack so hard the strap cut into my hand. He wasn't coming back. He just left me there while looking right at me. How could he do that? The parking lot was rapidly emptying, but I was not going to stand there and cry in front of everyone. Trembling with fury, I stormed away to find a place to calm down, think, and plot how I was going to murder my brother in his sleep. After I figured out how I was going to get home. I could text Mom, but she and Dad were both at work. Grandma and Grandpa would be busy, too. I flopped down under a tree near the back corner of the parking lot. Allie said she had a club meeting, so I didn't think she could give me a ride unless I waited for her to finish. I didn't know anyone else well enough to ask. I bit my lower lip hard and looked up quickly, trying to blink away the tears before they spilled over. But there was no one nearby, and unless someone walked right past me, I didn't think I'd be easily seen. 
I finally gave in and buried my face in my knees, sobbing quietly half from anger and half from sheer disappointment. The whole day I just kind of sucked, and I felt stupid for being so glad to be back. Are you crying? Shoot! I looked up, hastily wiping out my face as I wondered who was crashing my little pity party. Whoa! Hello, goth boyfriend. Is that, um, Graves' son? <laughs> a super tall guy in a leather jacket was standing nearby looking down at me. I hadn't even heard him walk up. I'm fine. I rode the back of my hand across my eyes, feeling pathetic. There was no way he'd believe I, was cr I wasn't crying. Really? I nodded vigorously, but from his tone it was obvious he knew it wasn't true. <laughs> Whatever. He turned away and walked to a motorcycle parked nearby. Ugh, I can't believe someone caught me crying. How middle school of me. I watched him set the helmet on the seat and stow his backpack. I probably shouldn't have stared, but he was kind of rude, so I was going to stare all I wanted. If I was going to revert back to middle school with my behavior, I might as well take it all the way. He paused and glanced my way again. I watched him grab something and stalk back over. He tossed something square and rectangular to me. I barely managed to catch it. Achoo! Facial tissue! I love that you have a packet of tissues with you. Tissues. Th thanks. Okay, maybe he's actually a nice guy. He shrugged. Is there a reason you're sitting back here crying? Yes. Yes. Yes, there is. I glared up at him, daring him to try to pry further. He just looked sort of amused, but not at all intimidated. I guess I couldn't blame him. How tall was he, anyway? I was going to strain my neck looking up at him. Thanks. For the tissues, I mean, not for badgering me about crying. I wasn't badgering, I was asking. But it's not a problem. I'm Ewan. Ewan? 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 I'm Ewan, by the way. That was an interesting name. Ewan. 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 Okay. Post-production <laughs> editing will go in there. Mariposa. He just nodded and crouched next to me. I don't recognize you. I'm new. Sort of. I used to live here a few years ago, but I just moved back. Ah. Oh. You're that girl. I gave him a questioning look, but he just shrugged. I overheard some kids talking about a new girl. Something about some disappearances a few years back. Ugh. Again? That's me. I see. Well, you look more normal than I expected. What's that supposed to mean? Hey, I was just about to leave. Are you waiting for a ride? Do you need a lift or something? Oh, I don't... Um... My brother ditched me, so I don't know yet. I'm still trying to figure out how to get home. I'll give you a ride if you don't mind riding a motorcycle. I haven't ridden one before. I'm not going to force you. Man, someone like that looked like this offered me a ride on a motorcycle? That would make my entire freaking day. <laughs> I bit my lip. I shouldn't accept a ride from someone I didn't know, but at the same time, I didn't know if anyone else could come get me. I'm taking it. You gotta live your life with some risks. Yeah, you know what? I'll take you up on that. I live out in Ravensblade. He almost smiled, but not quite. I live there too. He stood and helped pull me to my feet. Dang, he was really tall. The top of my head barely reached his chin. And that was with heels. I have an extra helmet you can use. Oh, thanks. Mom would definitely kill me if I showed up on the back of a motorcycle with no helmet. Then she'd probably kill you too. She hates making people feel left out. That elicited a smirk. <laughs> I'll keep it in mind. I watched him pull down two pegs on either side of the bike. I'm guessing my feet go there? His smirk grew wider as he tossed the helmet. <laughs> you get an A+. That bit gets really hot, so don't touch it. Anything else? Hold on, lean when I lean, and try not to fall off. Simple and to the point. 
I like it. He climbed on the bike and patted the seat behind him as he put the helmet on. I climbed on carefully, mostly occupied with how I should hold on to him. That and wondering why his helmet got a cool visor thing, but my face was bared for all the bugs in the world to splat onto. I hoped he didn't mind being my bug shield, because I was definitely going to hide my face behind him. Hold on, we're going. R right I placed my hands awkwardly on his hips as he started the bike, and we were off. It was cold! It was already well into fall anyway, but it was so much colder on the back of a motorcycle. Fortunately, our neighborhood was fairly close to the school. I quickly found myself grateful he was so much bigger than me. In addition to shielding me from bugs, he also blocked some of the wind. Not much, but I suspected it was colder sitting up front than behind. I just held onto him tightly and hoped the wind didn't permanently freeze my hands to his waist. That would have been awkward, but not the worst thing. Fifteen minutes and a short stop for specific directions later, and Ewan was pulling into my driveway. Spencer's car was there, but so was Dad's. By the time Ewan killed the engine, Dad was already on the front porch, eyes wide. Dad, this is Ewan? Ewan, this is Dad? Um, he's gonna be my new boyfriend, because he's got a motorcycle. I dismounted carefully, only narrowly avoiding falling on my butt. Nice dismount. I'd give it an 8.5 for style. I'm not going to tell you to shut up, but only because you were nice enough to give me a ride. <laughs> Dad swept me into a bear hug that muffled the rest of that. Hi, Dad. Thank God. You weren't answering your phone. Well, I couldn't. Really. Oh, this is you and a classmate. He gave me a ride. Dad offered his hand, though he didn't look too happy about the motorcycle. Ewan took his helmet off, shook Dad's hand, and gave him a surprisingly polite nod. It's nice to meet you, sir. He had that bad boy look about him, but I guess he wasn't actually that bad. It was kind of disappointing. Someone wearing that much leather really should have more attitude. Thank you for giving her a ride. I handed the helmet back to Ewan. Seriously, I really appreciate it. I'll treat you to a coffee or something sometime. Yeah, coffee date already! Don't worry about it. I guess I'll see you at school. He nodded and put his helmet back on, waving once as he started the bike. And with that, he was gone. <clears throat> Hi, Dad. Dad and I watched him in silence for a moment. You are so not treating him to coffee. Ever. Hey, he was nice enough to give me a ride. <laughs> Saying of which, please tell me my horrible brother is grounded. For a month, at least. Thank you, Dad. Come on, you look like you're freezing. I'll make you some hot chocolate. I snuggled into his side as, he, as we went in together. Best Dad. All in all, it wasn't a completely horrible ending to the day. Hooray! We did it. Okay, and that's a good place to stop. I wanted to get to the end of chapter two. This game is awesome. I'm loving it and all the characters. I've got so many questions and theories already. Um, so I definitely hope I can play this fully at some point. Uh, if you guys enjoyed it, uh, you can check out Steamberry Studio. They have a Tumblr and a Twitter account. And I'll have links to the game on Steam and Itch.io if you'd like to play it for yourself. Thank you very much for joining me, guys. I hope you had fun. I definitely did. And uh, until next time. I will see you later.